So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to the sensuality as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you have learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made in the new attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor for all the members of the body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with any form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Amen. Amen. Alexander the Great, uh, who lived way long before uh, Christ and almost paved the way in a, in, a, in a miraculous way, God used it to prepare uh, for the kingdom, uh, for his coming kingdom, uh, he, he, was, he, was, he ran an amazing army and a great army. He was a great man, well, because he was Greek, obviously, Alexander the Great. <clears throat> and, and so he, he ran his army with discipline. He made sure that his soldiers were well behaved because he felt even if the sort of the, the common foot soldier was well behaved and disciplined, ultimately it would affect his army so that he would have a great army. And you know how it conquered uh, so many uh, countries in the whole of Europe. He, he, he kept on hearing the name of, of this one soldier, foot soldier, who was who AWOLed often, who would go into town, get drunk, who would go and sleep around and uh, ill-disciplined and all the rest of it. So he, he had uh, the commanding officer bring that soldier to him in his tent. And so this man stood before Alexander the Great, and Ex Alexander the Great looked at him and said to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Alexander, sir. And Alexander the Great stared at him and locked eyes with him and said to him, either change your name or change your behavior. Either change your name or change your behavior. You can be not be known as Alexander as I am and behave the way you behave. And that speaks into what Paul is really saying when he's speaking about give it up. He, he's speaking about the, the name of Christ and how you and I, for those who have crossed the line of faith, have, have adopted the name of Christ unto our hearts. We have the name of Christ written on our hearts. And, and Paul is saying, what happens is this, is that, is that when you become a Christ follower, change takes place. He's, he's not hit, wanting to hit our, ourselves over the head with a guilt thing of saying, why haven't you changed? But he says change is inevitable. You cannot keep the name of Christ and not change. It's, it's, it's impossible. You cannot get to a place where you have the Holy Spirit within you and have your life not change. And so we're in the season of Lent in which we give things up. I wonder if you can just take uh, 30 seconds to Turn to the person next to you and tell them, and just one or two people sitting by themselves so someone needs to walk uh, so that we can't have people. Uh, turn to the person next to you and, and tell them what it is that you gave up for Lent. Now, do it now. Please don't be corny and say you've given up giving up something for Lent. That's old. It's almost as old as me saying I've given up vegetables for Lent.
All right. Well, let me tell you some of the things that we need to give up to God so that we can have this change of behavior. One of the things is our moods. Give up our mood. Uh, sorry, not our moods, our morality. Sorry. Our mor- we, we need to speak about morality. Sorry. There are parts of our lives, you know, Paul says, you must stop telling lies, tell each other the truth because we all belong to each other in the same body. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The, the essence of who Jesus was, was around truth. Now, I'm not speaking about white lies or lying to each other. While that's important that we do give up telling lies. I'm talking about what Paul is speaking about is about the truth about who you are. To, to be authentic, to, to stop lying to yourself and to others about who the true you is. And on one level, I could speak about the fact that for some of us, we've joined the army of God, am I right? But we prefer to be part of the secret service. We'd rather people don't know about our faith or that we're Christians. So we hear discussions going on, we hear conversations going on, and what do we do? We just keep quiet, even although it's racist, even although it's sexist, even although it's homophobic, we just keep quiet. And, and, and that's on the one level. But the other level is that we, we, we live this life. Uh, Putin, the president for life of, of Russia, um, he, 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 said, he was accused this last week or so of having a body double. Um, and so what was happening is that apparently when he was getting into dangerous, if he was being sent to dangerous situations, he wouldn't go. That makes sure that the, his speaking role, apparently, but even though this body double can even like speak like him, and as all the, so this, um, this body double would go where there's minimal speaking parts and all the rest of it, but apparently this person is like almost like an identical twin to Putin. And he refuted, he said, no, that's not, that's not true. I'm, I'm wondering if we walk around with body doubles where, where we try and impress other people, where we, where, we, you know, where we live these Facebook lives that everything's perfect or we, you know, but in essence, what Paul is saying is about, about being truthful is being true to who you are. See, God created you just as you are, and he loves you the way you are. You don't need a body double. You don't need someone else. You don't need to be someone else. God is, the, and the essence of being a Christ follower is being authentic. That's why Christians are clear. Hey, man, we're not perfect. So why do we try and impersonate, and why do we try and put out an image that we are perfect? We're not perfect. And for those who understand Jesus Christ and the grace and mercy of Christ, he knows that while we strive to be perfect, we're not perfect. Christians mess up big time. I wish I could say we lived these perfect lives and we always said the right thing and did the right thing, but we don't. Am I right? We don't. But rather be real and truthful about who you are in Christ than offer up a fake persona. You see, then what happens is this, is that when we we lose touch with reality, and in fact, the the reverse happens, we lose touch with who, about about our own failings in, because if we're trying to put across this perfect persona, then we put pressure on those around us, we kill relationships, we're, we're not authentic, but when Christians come and go, I know I'm a sinner. Even Paul said it, I know I'm a sinner. Paul said, I try and do the right thing, but I always end up doing the wrong thing. And so many of us can identify with that. And this is the craziest thing of all. The one who really counts, the one who we really want to impress, the one who we really want to show, already sees past all our fakeness and our body doubles. He knows our true heart. We cannot kid God. We cannot pretend with God. So who's the true you? You may not be satisfied with it. You may think other people are not satisfied with it. But let me tell you something. God is satisfied with who you are because you were created in his image. So stop trying to put on a thing about trying to impress other people. But be true to who you are. Be true to who you are. This, uh, this guy was telling me he was uh, lying on the beach in Mishlanga in December, busy chilling. 
uh, and this little kid, must have been like seven years old, comes up to him and says to, says to him, do you believe in God? So this guy's like a bit, con- a bit confused. He goes, well, yes, I do. And this like seven-year-old kid asking him, stranger. He says, do you go to church every Sunday? This guy goes, yeah. Do you read your Bible every day? He's like, yes. Do you pray every day? It's like he was going, what is going on? Who is this kid asking all these questions? He said, yes, I do. And with that, the kid like almost sighed a sigh of relief and took out 20 rand out and said, in that case, will you please hold my money while I swim? (laughs) (laughs) You are the best version of you. God already has that covered. You were created in his image. Can we use this time of Lent in preparing to say, who's the real Gary? Can we, can we strip away all the titles, all the pretense, all the fakery, all the imagery, or everything else, and in our own raw form come before Christ this Lent? The second thing is our moods that I was speaking about. Give up our moods. Paul says, when you are angry, do not sin, be sure to stop being angry before the end of the day. Do not give the devil a way to defeat you. I'm amazed at how our moods and our anger and things like that are, are, are affected and stipulated by those around us. And how the behavior of other people and other things, especially, now I'm not saying Christians are completely cold to the world. But how is it that we allow other people to affect our moods like we do? It's ridiculous. When we read about the scripture saying the fruits of the spirit, in other words, the fruits that in you and I love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, all of that stuff, that's how we live our lives. But I'm watching people get more and more infected and affected by the things that are going on around them that steers them off the course of being a Christ follower. It's incredible. So you have to be honest here because we're in church, okay? How many of you get mad and angry at taxi drivers? Put up your hands, be honest. Okay, I want to ask you this question as you get mad in your car. So how many of you have spoken, when I say spoken, you know what I mean, <laughs> to, uh, to taxi drivers from behind? Okay. Let me ask you this question for others that got a- a- angry at taxi drivers. When is the last time, as you fumed at a taxi driver or even swore at a taxi driver or went ballistic, whatever, that the taxi driver stopped his car and goes, hey, um, listen, yeah, I'm really kind of sorry that I did that, you know. Um, um, next time I'll indicate, but in the meantime, why don't you go first? But yet, I'm amazed how many people got freaked out. The rest of their drive to work is messed up by by a taxi driver driving badly. Can I ask you, has your anger or your bad mood ever changed the way taxi drivers drive their taxis? Nothing is ever going to change. We get so mad. We allow issues on Facebook. The other day, I was furious about it. I am... I, I said something about Declare denying that apartheid was a crime against humanity. I'm like, how can you say that? It, it was a crime against humanity. Man, did I set off something there like you have no idea? Everything from why am I involved in politics? Jesus is one of the, <laughs> Jesus wasn't involved in politics at all, was he? No, don't get involved in party politics. I'm not going to stand up in my red overall here on a Sunday. Or something like that. I'm not going to, you know, I understand party politics, but the church cannot be a, and it's interesting because every, you go and read my comments if you follow me on Facebook. What was the standard answer from every white person that follows me? Yeah, but what about corruption? We're not talking about corruption. We talk, but you can't believe how people's moods were affected in that moment. People were freaking out left, right, and center. Why do we allow that to happen? I don't know how long after the Sona debate did people, people freaking out about what was happening in Parliament. Oh, our country is bad, our government is a joke, blah, and all the rest of it. Zach, like, how can we, now don't be disinterested and disinfected, I get that. But when it controls our emotions, 
when it controls our moods. Let me tell you something. When, if you read the Old Testament, 455 times it mentions that God was angry. Jesus was angry. He chased people out the temple and he whipped some people. It's what we do with our anger. It's what we do with our moods. It's what we do with stuff around us. But let me tell you something, friends. If you and I are going to ride a roller coaster of mood swings because of things that have affected us outside uh, that we have no influence over, we're just losing out on being a great witness. The word of God needs to be the thing that sets our mood. Our quiet times in the morning, our reading of the scriptures, our prayer time, our quiet time, our devotional time, let's focus on that. There's something severely wrong with us as, as society if we allow something like Facebook, for example, to affect our moods. There was a, um, a, an elder and the pastor playing golf. And um, the elder misses the putt. He loses it, kicks the golf cart, punches a tree, throws his club. The pastor goes, are you insane? What are you, you can't get so angry like that because you missed the putt. I mean, seriously, two holes later, misses another putt, kicks the tire of the golf cart, throws his club away again, breaks a tree branch, just throws his ball away, goes ballistic. He says, I can't believe I missed, I missed. And the pastor said, man, you can't, I mean, you don't know, next thing God's going to strike you down with lightning or something like that if you, if you carry on doing this, you know, just because you missed the putt. Anyway, for a while, the elder gets pretty chilled, he gets to the ninth hole, short putt, pulls it right, misses it again. All of a sudden, the sky goes dark, clouds form, lightning bolt from the heavens, bam, burns the pastor to a crisp. There's just silence. And from the heavens, all you hear is, I missed. I can't believe I missed. <laughs> there's something. There's something. Please hear me. There's something about allowing things that are out and beyond of our control where we have to stop that from affecting us the way it affects us. And we have to trust God. We have to trust God. And just like shouting at a taxi driver, moaning about Sona, about the government, moaning about Eskim, has it helped? The levels of stress, and, and there's something about, I think, that for those who are Christ followers, that people need to stand back and look at us and go, isn't it amazing how this person can remain calm, who's not negative and swearing and aggressive and all the rest of it. I want to know what it is that controls this person, because whatever they've got, I want. And to be honest with you, for my own sake, for the sake of Gary Rivers, I want to give God control of my life. I don't want the outer things to control my moods and my attitude towards life. I want God and his Holy Spirit to do that. And this is what Paul is speaking about. Okay, I'm nearly done. Our money. Paul says in that scripture, if, you, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in, in need. Now, Paul's going like, work hard for your money. He gets that. But also, be generous. Also be generous. There's a lot about being a Christian, and I'm not just talking, I know, I know and I can go on about tithing, and the Old Testament speaks about how we need to tithe. Jesus doesn't speak about it, um, stopping tithing. He says, carry on with those things. But he adds something different to it. He speaks about um, adding this change of our hearts when we give, and he asks for us to be generous. To be honest with you, I'm a bit surprised if I read the scriptures at how much God doesn't look about whether we tithe or not. But I'm amazed at how God looks at our attitude towards the things we have and the things we hold on to. God looks at our attitude towards the things 
we have and the things we hold on to. And I guess how we treat our money and our things uh, as part of the Lenten thing, um, and I get for those who have given up chocolates and that, but, but part of the essence of Lent um, is around fasting. Uh, it's, around, it's about giving to the poor. Uh, those are one of the three main things is, is giving away and generosity. The original understanding of Lent is that during Lent, we are meant to be extraordinarily, gener- extraordinarily generous. So inevitably, I go and stand in front of my cupboard and I'm looking at, at all my clothes and all my shoes. I don't know about you, but I think two things go through our mind. One is that that's definitely going to come back into fashion again sometime, so I'm going to hang on to it, as we see, you know. Or two, I know I'm going to get down to that weight again. And one day, those pants are going to fit me, and I'm keeping them just in case. But part of this reflection, a physical manifestation of what Jesus is speaking about here, I know this sounds simple, is what's left behind in our cupboards, our shoes and our clothes. I know I'm getting personal here. But there is genuinely stuff in our cupboards. You know, there are some people that would die and, and their day would be made if they just had one of the things that we don't need anymore. And so it's a real challenge for me, for example, Lent, is how I deal with my finances. What I do with the absolute excess of stuff that I have. I've been been dealing with people who are looking for jobs. Do you know how hard it is to, to find a job without having a cell phone or airtime? Do you have any idea? Because there's no ways anyone can contact you. Uh, and I thought I should, I should challenge Grace Point because I know so many people have got upgrades and are sitting with spare phones in there um, at home. And I wonder if I could challenge the people of Grace Point to, to take one of those phones that you've got, load a hundred rand airtime or a, and a hundred rand data and bring the SIM card with that data and airtime to the office. Say, so I want to give this to someone who's looking for a job. 200 bucks and my spare phone. Because we've got so much and there's so many things that other people could do with the things that we think are wasted. The things that are, are gathering dust at home. God is looking at me. Now, now what I love, and maybe this is a good test. Jesus says in Malachi chapter three, give 10% of your income. It's the only time where, where God says, test me in this. The only time, the only time in scripture when Jesus says, te- I mean, when God says, test me. And the irony is this, he says, test me in this. And then he goes, see if I will not open up the heavens and open the floodgates that you will have so much in your barns that you won't know what to do with it. And then he goes back and says, test me. I can imagine like God almost playing, <laughs> come on, just test me on this. How about this for Lent at so the end of March and April or just the end of March? Collect your stuff during the month that you, don't, that you have excess of. Take 10% of your income and test God. I'm not saying it. Read Malachi chapter 3. Test God. How we deal with our excess, how we deal with our material stuff. God looks at that and asks interesting questions of us. And then finally, our mouths. We need to, we need to give up the way we speak to people sometimes. Apparently every day, you and I speak thousands of words. Studies show apparently that we speak an average of 16,000 words per day. Personally, Rebecca, I think you speak more than 16,000. I'm just saying. And I know this is an average, but I think you may be on about 22, 23,000. No, no, I've got the mic. I'm only kidding. Now, some words are carefully planned and selected. Others are spoken impulsively. Some are spoken quietly. Others, we raise our voices. 
Some of our words are used with a desire to help and encourage people, but some with a motivation to hurt, belittle, humiliate, and retaliate. In Ephesians, it says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Imagine that. So here's the test. Go to your friends, go to your family, and say to them, this is, do this. I, 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 go to them and say to them, are my words, do my words bring about encouragement? Because you know what happens? We get into the habit. You know, if, I don't know if this has happened to you, but if you hang around with a person that swears a lot, have you noticed what happens? Eventually, you start letting out one or two words. Or if you hang around someone that's incredibly negative, you end up speaking negatively. It, it's like we, this brushes off on each other, especially the things that we say. Hang around with someone long enough and you end up speaking like them. My China. You know what I'm saying? Seriously. So I'm wondering if for a moment in that you could ask those around you, when I speak, are my words encouraging or are they belittling? Ask those around us. Someone lied to us, by the way. They said, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never harm me. Do you remember that? Do you remember that saying? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. We were lied to. That person was smoking pot when they wrote that. Our words break each other's hearts. They do. We break each other down. Someone said this before. It's old. I know this. And if you've got a, your cell phone and you want to write this down or tweet it or Facebook it, we need to think before we speak. Think. T, is it true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for how much you love us. Your grace and your mercy astounds us. We are forever grateful to you and for what you do in our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen.